to everybody who's been liking the videos so far. We thank y'all. You guys liking the videos has kind of helped us start to grow the channel even more. So we appreciate it. To those who have not, please, we ask you, hit the like button before you even watch this video. It helps us grow the channel, helps people learn about us, and, and allows us to make more great content like this. So that's all we got. Thank you for helping us grow this channel. Hit the like button right now and uh, on with the show. Super duty tough work. Mm -hmm. We are here, folks. Got a special guest with me this week, Dr. Alex McNeil. And, uh, you know, he's our first doctor on the show. And we talk about a lot of topics about artistry. And this week we want to talk about, you know, uh, artistic anxiety and things that artists face and kind of how to get past them. And, you know, you guys know Elijah and I have our opinions and our experiences, but I thought it would be great to bring in an actual doctor, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a, a psychologist who understands, you know, these things at a deeper level. And we can kind of talk about some of these topics that we may speak about, but have him give us a professional opinion and uh, on it. And so Super Duty Tough Work, I welcome to you. Dr. Alex McNeil. Thank you so much. I really appreciate <laughs> being on the show. We've known each other for a long time. I know, uh, man. Through doctor being uh, the doctor at work and also the the B boy yeah. side. The yeah, the B boy side. side. Yeah, me and me and Alex go way back. Those of you who live in Columbus may remember a spot called Carabar. Mm. And there was a spot there where we started uh, doing shows. We were the first people doing hip hop shows at Care Bar. It was a free bar over in Old Town East. And one thing when Elijah and I started doing greenhouse shows, I had this idea to like, instead of having all these openers, why don't we do something with the B-Boys? Mm -hmm. And so me and Alex, you know, I don't know if I can reveal his B-Boy name. Uh, B-Boy Glass. <laughs> B-Boy Glass. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible Breakers crew. <laughs> yes, man. Yeah. So y'all know, you know, he's a hip hop head, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, we we started chatting and, I, and, I, and they were having issues, I think, at the time getting venues for a whole night, you mm -hmm. know, because a lot of venues will say, well, you can't charge this cover. And if you can't have this thing going on, we don't want to give you me for all night. So we were like, OK, why don't we just take the first two hours of our night mm. and have them use it. And then we'll start our show at like nine 30, 10. Yep. And then it'll, everybody gets what they want and they don't have to deal with a venue. We'll deal with the venue. They get to do their own people. And they were doing B boy battles and mm -hmm. giveaways. And it was mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. And we did this a couple of times and it was packed every time we did. Yes. Amazing dope. events. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, then, then, you know, he kind of disappeared for a while. Mm hmm. To get my doctorate. And, yep, went back to school, got his doctorate, mm -hmm. relocated back to Boston. Yes. Right. And uh, you know, and we relinked up because he became a fan of the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you said you were listening to Super Duty Tough Work while you were studying, right? Studying for my licensure exam. I was listening to Super <laughs> Duty Tough Work. And uh that was my you know, not only Mondays, but also mm. there was such a backlog of episodes that I would be able to listen to it every day. Just wake yeah. up, Super Duty Tough Work podcast, just go <laughs> study, you know, start off the day right. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And now, you know, he just launched his own podcast, mm -hmm. which is called Mental Health Explained. Yes, absolutely. Uh, which, which I kind of helped him kind of through uh, creating and it's really dope and for those of you out there who have questions it's a it's an invaluable resource but um i'd like to hear you just explain uh quickly to, to the people like w what your goal is with your podcast in terms of uh, educating people it's you hit it on the head it's educating people it really is a podcast so that we're able to explain sometimes deep sometimes complex complex uh complex ideas in simple ways so that you don't have to have a doctorate to understand you don't have to have a master's mm. or even a degree to understand we're just ex explaining things that are incredible resources for people such as ieps what is an iep uh that's an episode i'm hoping to get at some point uh episodes we already have is what is individual therapy what is psychological testing a lot of these things people know about but they don't know the details and when they don't know the details, I feel that a lot of people are strayed away from mm. accessing them. 
So if you know, then you become familiar with them. It's not so scary. It's a thing that's approachable. That is the goal of the podcast, to make all of these things approachable. Mental health has become such a large, not only a subject, but there are institutions, plural, around mental health built to help the public. However, there's a gap in knowledge. Mm. A lot of, there are wonderful mental health podcasts out there and there are incredible resources out there. I noticed though, there was a need in the community for podcasts to bridge the gap between expertise and just the, the person, just the person on the street, the average person yeah. that doesn't know anything about it, but might need it. Mm. So that way, if there is anybody, I was just talking to somebody on the laundromat yesterday about it, you know, <laughs> she was like, okay, I'll check it out. You know, no mental health training at all, but there was certainly a need on her part. Yeah. So that is exactly why I made it. There's four people to feel that mental health is not some foreign thing. It is mm. something for you. Yeah, that's amazing. And you do interview other mental health professionals. Exactly. Every week, right? So what we do, the format is, is, is that every single week, we I interview somebody who has an expertise in the subject that we're talking about. And we break down the concept so that it is about an hour. Sometimes episodes are about a half an hour long. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's about an hour long. It depends on the subject. Mm -hmm. And... Every single week is a new guest, unless it's a two-parter or a three-parter or something like that. And we always focus on the details of the subject that are very, very important, but in a way that breaks down the jargon so mm -hmm. that the guest and I can translate our expertise into uh, understandable concepts. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, again, it's called Mental Health Explained. Mm -hmm. There's how many episodes? You got about six or seven now? We got about already? six. Yeah, we got yeah. about six episodes out now. Seventh one is coming out very soon. Okay. Yep. And it's everywhere where podcasts are. Definitely Spotify because we spent a, quite a bit of time trying to get it there and it finally worked. Uh, we got on iTunes. Spotify, iTunes. SoundCloud. Uh, SoundCloud. Yep. Google Play. Google Play. Everywhere. 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 And the everywhere. website. <laughs> and there's a website, alexmcneil.com. Bam, bam. See, he's everywhere, folks. And see, he's now the, the resident uh, doctor for, <laughs> he's like the Dr. Phil of the Oprah Winfrey show. Remember when Dr. <laughs> Phil first came around? I don't remember that. <laughs> oh, man. Be before Dr. Phil had a show, he would be on Oprah's show like every three months. Mm, excellent. Talking, talking about mental health stuff. And then that's kind of, and then eventually he got so popular for doing that, he just jumped off his own show. Oprah got his own show. Oh, man, Dr. I Phil. didn't even realize that's what happened. Yep, yep. He was he was just like a guy she called in every couple months That's just to, to speak on the topics. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so so this episode we're gonna talk about, you know, artistic anxiety. And we've got a bunch of scenarios from financial to relationships, acceptance, failure, purpose, uh, all this pandemic stuff, dealing with success. And we're gonna kinda go topic for topic and we're gonna kind of speak to the doctor about these things, about what artists should be thinking, what should we should be doing and and how to kind of mitigate these things. And so we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. We got you stuck off the realness, the most infamous you heard of us. Official podcast murderers, the show comes equipped with few points to share. Grown man ideas for all those who care and want to grow. So go ahead and download every single week with a brand new episode. You're not alone in this world, cousin. So we share information and honest discussion and keep repping a culture like we supposed to. They spread gossip, but they never come close to. I can hear it inside their tone. They talk about the industry, but never Never left their home, you get laced up with bullet points and such, plus empowering topics that they never would touch. You can put your whole network against the team, but super duty tough works the MVP. Most valuable podcast on MP3. Priceless info, but all of it's free. Huh. So take these words home and think them through. Super duty tough work is coming at you. You are now listening to Super Duty Tough Work. With your host, Blueprint, raw and uncut, adult conversations, no shucking, no jiving, and no bullshit. shit. 
All right, folks, we're back. Super Duty Tough Work. Pregnificence. Dr. Alex McNeil. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> <laughs> we're here, the most infamous podcast on planet Earth. You know, this week we are talking about managing artistic anxiety with the good doctor. And the first area we want to talk about today, which a lot of you artists deal with, I deal with, mm-hmm. every artist deals with, is financial anxiety absolutely what do i mean by that by financial anxiety we understand the life of artists first dynamic artists are not paid by the hour uh we're paid by the product assuming we have products we might be paid by the show by the performance but it's not like your typical nine to five job where artists uh, show up, end of the week, you get some. I've been on tours where it might be a 10-week tour. One week, we just broke even. One week, we might not have made anything. Other weeks, we might have made money. Uh, I've been in situations where maybe I've been on tour and, you know, van breaks down in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. You know, and you might not have that much bread, but you got to figure out how to get it fixed. Um, what I'm getting at here is that artists, unlike some other people, because of the unpredictable nature, and honestly, it's kind of like a, a sales job, <laughs> you know, <a> commission based <laughs> job. Uh, we tend to deal with a different kind of artistic, uh, anxiety and financial anxiety because some of these things are not known. Um, and what this thing's manifested in for me, I noticed was that there was a period where I was kind of refusing to look at the future. Mm. because um, my financial stuff was so unknown, it was kind of hard to plan. Mm. Now, I eventually got past that and realized that, you know, you plan, you do your best with what you have. You don't just say, well, you know, F the future because I don't have it right now. Yeah. You, you, you still plan. But the point I'm getting to for everybody at home is that uh, financial anxiety for artists is very real. Mm-hmm. And um, as it is for everyone, but you know, I, I would love to hear your opinion on just like some of these scenarios and how. Wh- what do you think artists should be thinking about when they're dealing with these these situations? Sure, absolutely. You know, a couple of things come to mind first, and I want to just say before I explain anything is is that you know this when I explain these things, this is uh, for the podcast, and really, uh, it is not uh, you know formal medical treatment diagnosis right uh it was, the disclaimer <laughs> yeah it's it's it, there is a disclaimer that has to be said yeah. because the thing is is that you're going to hear this from me uh in this podcast but uh you know any information that's co- delivered through this podcast should not be understood as a recommendation that you should not consult with a medical or health professional to address your particular situation and i strongly encourage that our listeners consult with medical providers or qualified mental health uh, providers with issues and questions regarding any physical and or mental health symptoms that, or concerns that they might have. Disclaimer. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very important. I think also if we go to the, we're talking a little bit about fin- financial anxiety, but print, do you mind if I do a little bit of a helicopter and I, talk about anxiety in general for a yes. second. Yes, please do. Please do. The question is, what is anxiety? Uh, anxiety is a stress response that the body makes in order to help protect you from things that are deemed frightening. So it's a stress response, basically. Now, this mm-hmm. might be inherently frightening, like heights. Uh, oftentimes, people are just inherently frightened by that, or you know, sometimes snakes or, or anything that uh, people are just hardwired for. Or... Uh, those fears might have been conditioned. So you might have learned those fears. The question is how to best address those fears that have been conditioned or inherent. Uh, Usually when a person becomes anxious, they get into a very fast, very strong fight, flight, or freeze mentality. Uh, Prince said, uh, F the future, uh, when he was thinking about his finances, that is avoidance, that is a flight. Mm -hmm. Uh, And avoidance is usually the thing that people get used to. Uh, usually what happens is, is that a situation becomes frightening and it's uncomfortable and they avoid it. And then they avoid it over and over again. 
And then it builds up the fear even more because uh, it's exactly what you don't want to do. And then if you, and maybe more accurately when you, approach it again, it is extremely frightening that 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 little shadow has turned into a big monster in your brain. Mm-hmm. And I think this conversation will help talk about how not to avoid, but also be able to strategically approach uh, anxiety in various parts of being an artist. So we're talking about uh, a one last thing. Remember that your body is going to say no. So your body really responds to this and your mind does too. And we'll talk about those strategies in a second. But I want you to just listeners to just be aware that those sensations, your body will feel and it's very strong, but deep down, you know, that there's a need to do something. We're talking about finances right now. You need to know your finances. It's, you can't, you know, cash rules, everything around me. There's no way to avoid that. The question is how to build up the strength to address it. So we're talking about the finances right now and we're talking about financial anxiety. So a couple of things that are really important with anxiety is is that there are some formal treatments that are very very helpful for this one of them is called cognitive behavioral therapy and we're going to go over a lot of these concepts today with cognitive behavioral therapy cognitive behavioral therapy basically means that your cognition which basically means your thinking it's very important and your thinking is both affected by your environment and will affect your environment. It will affect your feelings. It'll affect your body. It'll affect your environment. And how we think about a situation is very important. Sometimes we view a situation as very frightening. And what our mind does is it creates something that a lot of cognitive behavioral therapists refer to as cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions are basically ways that your brain changes the conclusion of information, sometimes even draws a conclusion out of information that you made up that's not even there. So it's not. So so you're saying like the mind Mm -hmm. can see the same information, Mm -hmm. but draw two different conclusions based on how you are taught to perceive that information. Or I, to I deal think with your thoughts. Yeah, I think there's a couple of important things you just said. So the question is, how many conclusions do you draw out of it? Usually when people have strong cognitive distortions that they're used to, mm-hmm. that they draw one conclusion and they stick to it and it's very strong. The problem is, is that that conclusion might not be accurate. Mm-hmm. And also that conclusion creates more anxiety and more fear yeah. for you. And then the other thing you said that's really interesting is the things that were taught to you. Sometimes it is taught to you. So I'm going to break down one cognitive distortion right now that uh, a lot of a lot of us know. I, I'm I'm you know halfway convinced that ninety percent of us know. It. You know, I just yeah. did a lot of fractions there. But um, the cognitive distortion is called catastrophizing. Mm-hmm. What you do is you get information. And you blow it up and you think it's going to be a catastrophe. You think it's going to be the worst thing in the world. You think everything is going to end. You yeah. know, my show didn't sell. I'm not going to be an artist anymore. That's it. Yeah. It's over. You know, it's a yeah. wrap. Now, what you said is that taught you or not. Sometimes that is. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. we do grow up with parents or we do grow up around people that are strong influencers that catastrophize all the time, all the time on the tall. And then we think that that is the way that the world works. So we do it. Sometimes that happens to us, that we independently develop that, in other words. I, do you know of anybody who's in uh, nursing? Who does nursing? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yep. Sometimes catastrophizing is actually a huge advantage because what you want to do is you want to take it to the nth degree and make sure everything's okay so that the yeah. patient doesn't die. So assuming the worst scenario, just to make sure that you're, and then if the best scenario happens, then you know you could be based. But if the worst scenario happens, you're already prepared for it. Sometimes that happens to people in their profession. I've seen, I've seen the worst scenario happen with artists on the road Mm -hmm. where they catastrophize a promoter, not paying them. Okay. They catastrophize, like you're saying, 
the crowd not liking them mm-hmm. because one person in the crowd didn't like them. Mm-hmm. And right. then it became F everybody. Yeah. Right? They do something destructive, get in a fight, right? throw the money away. I've seen guys assault promoters yeah. because they thought that they weren't going to get paid and just someone else had their money or something weird happened or they got and they got too drunk. And yes. Then, so they were catastrophizing. They the catastrophizing. Way. And that creates such an anxiety response. I'm going to say some other common cognitive distortions that happen. So uh, some other co- uh, common ones that I wanted to just say to listeners is overgeneralizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and there's a term in cognitive uh, behavioral therapy that's called selective abstractions, which means drawing a conclusion based off one element in a situation, right? Mm. So there's one piece of evidence, and then all of a sudden, there's a conclusion drawn based off of just one thing. Mm-hmm. But you're not accounting everything else that's happening. Another kind of distortion is uh, personalization, thinking that everything is your fault. Ma- there's another one, magnification, you're magnifying things, blowing things up, or minimizing things. Oh, that's not a problem, and it really is a problem. Mm. And then the last one I'm going to say is arbitrary inference. That's a, that's a fancy schmancy term that basically means drawing conclusions when there is no evidence. Um, somehow in your mind there is something that is quote-unquote true uh, and for sure, and that's extremely anxiety-provoking. But in reality, when you check the situation, there's yeah. actually no evidence that that's true. Like uh, I have haters. Like I got mad haters, and then you don't even have no haters, and you just work yourself up thinking everybody hates you, and you walk around. You put out an album, and somebody's like, I didn't really like track seven. You're like, mad haters. Yeah. You're right. the <laughs> They'd be like, the rest of the record was great, though. Nah, man, <laughs> F that. Man, you like, like track seven? <laughs> exactly. Stop hating. Exactly. Y'all don't, don't want to see me eating over here. Right, right. <laughs> you, you know? Yeah, that sounds like I definitely do the personalization one mm, because, I, but I think the personalization one comes from the sense of I think it's the byproduct of this sense of extreme ownership I take sometimes. Mm. Right, where if you if. I've I've had to assume a being an independent artist an extreme level of ownership where it's like yeah. no matter what goes down the buck stops at me. Sure. So often I find myself taking ownership for things that are not even my fault. So like let's say for example uh I re I reprinted a record in this winter, right? It was a yeah. vinyl repress and I took three orders for it and everything and they were like, "Okay, oh, we're going to deliver it on this day." Yeah. On December 20th. Yes. December 20th came around. It was two albums. Only one of them was ready. Sure. They said, oh, so, sorry, Al. The other one had a problem with this thing. The artwork, we, we printed the same artwork for both. It's not, it's, uh, we apologize. You know, we'll make this right. But it was delayed a month. Mm. I felt bad. Like I messed up. Mm. I've, I had, I went and apologized to my fans because I had this level of extreme ownership that made me sure. personalize this failure. That wasn't even necessarily my failure. Mm. You know, extreme ownership can be an an extraordinary thing. And I'm a huge fan of the Jocko Willis. Um, I'm I'm so sorry if I forgot the the name of the other uh, um, writer who wrote the book about extreme ownership. Jocko Willis wrote. Uh, Incredible concept. Let's go over some strategies on how to address this anxiety because I think it touches based on extreme ownership. I think extreme ownership can be really great, but there's some things to keep in mind, some strategies to keep in mind that can help balance all of this out. So one of them is called mindfulness. Now, this isn't strictly, when I talk to you this during this podcast, I want you to just keep in mind that I'm kind of like, in just one respect, <laughs> I'm kind of like Bruce Lee. In no other respects, I'm like Bruce Lee, but just in this one thing, I'm like Bruce Lee. Um, which is, I'm going to take many styles and put it together. Okay. Uh, you know, Bruce Lee, you know, commented that he took from everything and saw just kind of what helped. Yeah. Um, and what created the the best, what was for him. Um, uh, to my knowledge, that's kind of how Bruce Lee worked. It's kind of how I work too. I'm taking many different things. This next thing is called mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is a really good concept to get attached to when you're talking about 
addressing the different parts of anxiety. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is basically being able to be in the moment, not stray far away from what is reality. And that is very, very difficult because like I said, our mind strays away to different things. How, so what, if we break this down, what can we do? There is something called dialectical behavioral therapy, which broke down different parts of mindfulness. The parts of mindfulness that it broke down is called the what skills and the how skills. So mindfulness, the what skills, what to do to be mindful. So the first thing is observe. Notice your experience. Let things in your mind. Don't chase them. Be alert about your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. You know, you sense what's happening in your body. You sense what's happening in your mind. And you just observe. Don't do anything else. Just observe. Then the second thing, describe. Put your words into experience. I work with kids a lot. I work with kids a lot. And one of the things I've noticed with kids and one of the things a lot of parents and a lot of people notice with kids, a lot of times when the kids get extremely afraid or extremely angry, a lot of times it's because they can't put their thoughts into words. They don't have the verbal language for it yet. So they just go, ah, (laughs) instead of (laughs) articulating what is actually happening. It turns out that our verbal language can mitigate our anxiety. When we put things into words, it makes things more clear. So put your experience into words. So by I, that you so like if I'm saying okay, well I'm so me just even being able to say I have anxiety around my financial future. That's exactly it. That's the first step, right? That's the second. First is oh, the second. Step. First is observe. Okay, observe it. Just I, notice. Oh, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, why don't I give a fuck about the future? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm acting reckless. Mm-hmm. Something is wrong. What what's mm-hmm. going on? And then that. to be able to say, oh. I have anxiety about that thing. That's exactly it. I'm scared. I'm afraid of the financial prospects or my future because of this this, this career I'm in. That's exactly it. Okay. A lot of times when uh, people say this, just kind of in, in without knowing psychology, the way they say it is just being honest with yourself. That's basically what it is. Just being honest with yourself. Notice yeah. what's going on. Say it to yourself. Yeah. We're into words. The third thing is the third what skill is participate. Yeah. Be in the experience, be in the moment, you know, acting, practicing what you're doing, um, practicing all the skills and everything like that. Um, Participating is easier to say uh, than to do. How do you do it? How do you participate with all of those things? Well, that, beautifully leads into the how skills, how to do all of these things. And there is three main things that are really important. One, this is, this is a tough ask, mm-hmm. non-judgmentally. You mean with yourself, all, just saying with this self, is what it is. With yourself. Not, not putting a good or bad on it, just saying with this the, is what it is. This absolutely. Is not just with yourself, but with everything. Okay. You know, it's, there's a difference between saying – One person gave me a review where they gave me feedback about a track I gave. And there's a totally other thing with saying they think I suck or Mm -hmm. I think they suck or any of the judgment words. Because when you get into judgment, it gets murky and you get you stray far away with being in the moment because you're in your own head. Now you're concocting this thing, these judgments about a situation. It, it, It ups the anxiety. The other thing is, the, you know, DBT calls it one mindfully, which is doing one thing at a time. Um, don't, I mean, uh, speaking of your podcast, you have talked about this too. I remember your podcast episode about the books that you recommend. And mm-hmm. some of the books you recommended talked and advocate about just do one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. Don't distract yourself. Because when you're distracting yourself, you have all these partial thoughts about all these different things. And you can't really be in the moment because your brain is stretching. If your brain was a risk board, you've got your troops in other countries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spreading yourself too thin. Spreading yourself too thin. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the last thing I think is some of the most, one of the most important things uh, I've noticed 
about the how skills for mindfulness is effectiveness, effectively. So this goes back into the radical uh, or extreme ownership that you were talking mm-hmm. about. Okay, you're taking ownership. Is your thoughts clear? Are your thoughts clear? Are they effective? Are you being effective in your actions and in your thoughts? Mm. Are you, if you're thinking all of these things and they're creating anxiety, is that really being effective if we're taking a look at just doing things? Right. And that's right. important to analyze. I, I, I was wondering- like, Look at the outcomes. Look at the outcomes. Look at the process. Are you- being effective with your time? Are you being effective yeah. with, with your energy? And I was going to actually turn it to you. I was thinking to myself before the interview, I was like, I'm definitely going to turn it to you at some point because you've had so many years of experience. <laughs> yeah. Have yeah. you ever had that moment in your career where you've been like, you know what? All this thinking is making me less effective. Absolutely. Tell me Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think I get into that, that, that thing every album I create, mm. right? Like every album you create, especially for someone like me who... I have so many albums that are different. You know, I have instrumental records that are different from my vocal records. I got, you know, records like Adventures in Counterculture where I'm singing on them and playing on them. I have records that are straightforward boom bap records. Yeah. Every time I do something different, I have to kind of get out of this 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 state where I'm second guessing everything, mm. where I'm questioning everything, and I have to get in a moment, as you mentioned, uh, and then ultimately say, yo, Okay, you've overthought this song a hundred ways. Yes. Yeah, what's the outcome? Right. Or you've overthought this album a hundred different ways, mm-hmm. and then you put it out there to the public, and the response was nowhere near the level of criticism that you weighed on yourself. Yeah. So uh, did that get you anywhere? Wouldn't it have been better to be in a moment, have fun, let the people decide? Yes. Right. And um, so, yeah, I definitely deal with that uh, artistically. Uh, Same thing with the financial stuff. Like I was going to ask about that. Yeah. I mean, at my at my at its core, that was one of the reasons behind uh, me drinking a lot. Mm. So instead of planning for the future, I was just saying, you know, forget it. It's kind of like that Nas line, you know, instead of saying F tomorrow, that buck the ball, the bottle could have struck the lotto. Like, you know what I mean? Like that line right, is yeah. always deep to me because he's saying, okay, instead of saying F tomorrow, I'm going to at least take a chance with this to make something for the future. Sure. Um, And I was, that line always sucked to me because it was like I was fucking with the bottle right. instead of investing that dollar to the future. And then shortly thereafter, after realizing that, as you, as you mentioned, like, yo, I'm stressed out about this financial stuff, but it's only because, you know, I'm not planning. Right. And I'm not being effective, as you mentioned. So if it's okay to feel anxiety about the future, right? Yes. We all do. But what I was doing was compounding the situation by not planning, mm-hmm. which was causing even more anxiety. That's exactly it. And and more destructive behavior. So once I started planning, I said, okay, cool. Instead of, if I feel this way, I need to make sure I'm doing something with money. Okay. I'm going to buy this rental property. Sure. I, I'm going to you know, get my fucking, uh, 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 uh IRA started, yeah. what, whatever it took, I'm going to start, I'm going to pay off my house. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just these things that allowed me to now sleep much earlier. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Um, were very, very important. Yes. And eventually I did enough of those things to where I could kind of not feel that anxiety, but you're absolutely right about the outcomes. Yes. Because I definitely hit a point where I was like, okay, yeah, I'm doing this. And, and all I'm doing is just overdrawing my account. Cause now I'm drinking $150 worth of alcohol a week. Sure. Where could that money be going? <laughs> what happens is that you went to the drawing board though. And mm-hmm. the thing is, is that you were able to separate your anxiety of your money. You were able to, uh, you know, use it effectively, but you weren't overdoing your anxiety that you were avoiding your financial planning avoiding going to the drawing board and taking a look Mm -hmm. at your finances and saying okay so applying to what i just said how can i just notice that if i'm catastrophizing or notice that i'm having all these thoughts that are creating anxiety put those to the side i I can acknowledge that i'm I'm, you know right i observe that i'm anxious about finances I could describe that. I could say, you know what? This is really making me nervous. And then I could participate in it. And when I participate in it, I just do that. 
I am not judgmental about myself and I'm just focusing on what's effective. And that's, it sounds like what you were doing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. I mean, so it sounds like I, 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 I uh, I accidentally did that the right way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you got results. Yeah, you, got results. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah, I can sleep a lot better at night. Yeah. So let so let's talk about the second one. This is a second area yeah. that I want to talk about. And this is one that's tricky because it's not just us by ourselves. The second area of artistic anxiety is I'm gonna call it relationship anxiety. Sure. Um, any artist understands relationship anxiety simply because you have different expectations now. Yes. Right. Um, as a person who's in a relationship, there are certain things that being an artist can uh, bring to the limelight. So maybe getting on, I've dated a woman where she didn't know who I was exactly. Mm. And we were great for months. Then we went to a show together. She came to my a show with me. And she freaked out because the whole dynamic had changed. Mm. She walked into a room and everyone knew me. Yeah. Everyone was there to see me. And it changed. She was just weird. And she got all freaked out, mm. started drinking, cussed out some people left. And then we talked about it. She's like, yo, it was just too weird for me being in that situation. And a lot of artists have to deal with this and to where some extent they have to really be cognizant of that person they're with. Um, because when you're in the spotlight and they're not, your, your reality is a little bit different. How you would deal with people, certain things you may find acceptable, certain things they might not find acceptable. Um, and it can create some stress. Um, and, I, and, and the, the part about being a public figure can cause a lot of, uh, uh, a stress in a relationship. And, um, you know, over the years, I've noticed that a lot of it has to come back to communication. Sure. You know, um, at the beginning, I never knew what it was like on the other end. Mm -hmm. I've heard other artists explain how they're dating someone and that person is always jealous Mm -hmm. Or that person is always paranoid about them cheating or things of that nature. And early in my career, I didn't really get it. Mm -hmm. Now I get it. Like maybe relate being in a relationship in our position is harder. And maybe the key is that we don't admit that it's different. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if you're just a regular person, I'm just a regular person two regular people are dating each other, then they don't have this big thing hanging over their head. Yeah. You know, and, and so they can move a, a certain kind of way. But when you, one of those people is a public figure, you have all these additional dynamics that are in there that can, that you have to move differently. It's almost like I've realized I've had to actually, I have to move and actually be more responsible, more aware or I guess mindful is the word that, that, that comes to mind based on what you said in the last segment mm -hmm. of my, um, my actions. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. It, there's a lot of different thoughts about it. Um, one of them is, is that I think you said something really interesting and I'm going to ask you, to, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to be a psychologist about this. Hey, that's the um, job, man. Right. That's why you're here. <laughs> it's automatic. It just comes out of my you said something really interesting when you were talking about the reality is different and some things are acceptable and some things are not acceptable. And it sounds like what you're talking about is boundaries. Yes. Say more about that. You find that uh, it's difficult to negotiate in these relationships. I found that I was kind of ignorant to it early. Mm, tell me about. So like early on, when you first come into uh, any type of notoriety, it's all new to you. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's this new fun thing. Yeah. And you're just soaking it all in. Maybe it means you're getting in the club for free. Maybe it means you're drinking for free. Mm -hmm. Maybe it means you know everyone everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. You're treated differently. Um, you're, you're the center of attention in many instances. Like, but you don't you don't draw boundaries because you're you want to experience it all ah right mm -hmm. the longer you go the more you realize that if you don't draw boundaries yeah that's when things can get destructive 
it sounds like also when you're in a relationship, if you don't draw boundaries, they're going to yes. notice this. Yes. And then they might become anxious because they yep. say, what boundaries are they going to cross? I thought that there was a clear lines for boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like when they, when the artist enters into this different sphere, they're going through all these different experiences that might be pushing the boundaries of the part. Mm -hmm. They yes. say, I don't want you yes. to do this, or I didn't think you would go this far. Right, right, right. It, it could be something like, I mean, I've seen, that, like, if, if a guy gets on stage, I've seen people do stuff where maybe you get on stage and, um, I don't know, maybe you take off your shirt. Mm, good example. Yeah, good right? example. Yeah. Tupac took off his shirt. DMX yeah. took off his shirt. Sure. But we never thought, what did they part of think about that? Because now you got this whole room objectifying them. Right. And to some extent, they've objectified themselves, right? They're being desired by everyone. And and the partner, what I realize is that it's not, it's not, it shouldn't be a hundred percent on the partner to be able to articulate that. Okay. Because it's new to them. Yeah. You know? And so I think now I know that you have to kind of, number one, you got to mitigate that. You yeah. got to be very conscious of your actions. And yeah. then two, you have to almost like initiate those conversations. Ah, Yes. Be like, what, 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 what are you okay with? What are you seeing here that makes you uncomfortable? Yes. Right? Because maybe they might feel like it's weird to bring it to you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Hey, can I ask you a question? Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, 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 I'm talking to a, a MC and, uh, you know, a, a really experienced MC has ever you've heard about or you in your own experience have had lyrics that your partner goes whoa 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 <laughs> did you just say that <laughs> oh no right uh, i've definitely got in trouble for lyrics before tell me about uh, I, I would love to hear what, this because yeah, i've always wondered that i'm like what do partners think about these but the lyrics that a person yeah. i was you were talking about nas earlier not have mm -hmm. this not has this old whole kind of album but like song streets disciple where he talks about yeah. like his old partners and stuff i mean khalees was on yeah. that song you know but like what do partners think about the lyrics yeah. that yeah uh it can get tricky yeah. it can get tricky and it's another one of those things where i think as an artist when you're creating you're telling yourself to remove all boundaries okay to remove all limits, sure. to lead, to take nothing off the table so that you can be as creative as possible. Sure. Right. But what we're not thinking of is like you're saying, there can be people who are in our lives who we say something and it has a, a, a mess, a, you know, a negative impact on sure. where they're like, Oh man, you said that I had a situation last summer, right? I, I wrote a song that was about, Trump, well, here's a funny story. So I had this sample from this soul record. It was called It's Over. Okay. Right. And so I made this beat when a guy was, the guy was, he was crying about his girlfriend leaving him. And it was the raindrops. And then the, the singing is like, it's over. Mm -hmm. You know, a real soulful fly song. Yeah. And so I sampled this song and I make, make a beat out of it. And I just love it. And I was like, man, I've never written a song about a relationship being over mm. and just having to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Like if I was like, I'm gonna write a song about that because to me, writing is not necessarily an exercise in telling my story as much as it's an exercise in telling a story. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm just like, let me just write this. It's like a writing exercise. So I'll write this story about this guy who basically didn't take his relationship seriously. Uh, by the time he found out his girl had another dude, Mm -hmm. uh, he was stalking her Facebook page. He thinks she's taking shots at him. He's salty. Um, but, you know, he, it's over and he just got to deal with it. And he, like even his mom's is like, yeah, you messed up, boy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of a sad, weird song because dudes don't really admit like, hey, man, look. I blew it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I need to just accept it. I need to stop. I need to get off her Facebook page. And so I wrote this song. And so this new girl I'm dating is in the car. She's like, let me hear the new stuff you've been working with on your album. Mm -hmm. And I just pressed play. Several songs uh -huh. later, I had dated this girl before, several years before. And then we got back together a couple years later. Yeah. She hears this song playing. She's like, who's this song about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? It's, it's yeah. just, in my mind, I'm thinking it's just a song that's it's a writing exercise mm -hmm. about the sample 
but she doesn't hear it like that. She's mm-hmm. like, oh, this is about me, huh? Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's not about me? Then what girl is it about? I'm like, yo. Oh, man. Big blow up, big argument. Sure. Because I was just like, yo, it's not about you. It's, it's not about anyone. It's just a writing exercise. Mm. And it's just art. Yeah. We're, I'm a writer. Yeah. But I never thought, because it wasn't even something that made my album it yeah. was just a song I wrote around a sample that I thought was fun. And she's like, let me just hear the stuff you're working on. Sure. Man, big blow up. Wow. So I, I've always wondered that. I've always wondered if the lyrics yes. get into um, <laughs> the relationships. How, do, how dare you say that on a record? How yeah. me? It's like, it's you, not about you. <laughs> yeah. You got to be very careful. Because, yeah, you could say something uh, right now. And then later on, someone could hear it completely out of context. Absolutely. Or, or maybe the context starts to fit what you're going through at that moment. And yeah. then it sounds like you were just writing that, like you knew it was going to happen or you were trying to be slick or sneak this. And it's like, nah, man, mm-hmm. you know, cause like I wrote this song uh, a couple years before. Yeah. Her. Oh man. So yeah, it's totally, totally not about that. Well, no. let, me, let me jump into a few things that I was thinking about as you were talking. And the first one, and I'm sure that you could talk about this, but when we, when we talk about these things and negotiate things, these things with our partner, there are certain things that can be toxic that can mm-hmm. come up. First is personalizing, uh, just thinking it's an attack. If somebody is s- talking about their views, their opinions, what they want, their boundaries, yeah, it's not an attack. And there are certain things that people can do that – can make things worse. One of them is getting very, very silent. The silent treatment, right? mm-hmm. the um, you know, <laughs> the root song, the silent treatment, right? Yep. You yep. know, another is when people become anxious. A lot of times, they become angry. Mm. You know, people become afraid. There's fight, flight, or freeze, but it's not as simple as fight, flight, or freeze. Sometimes people fight before they flight. Yes. Some people just (laughs) bam, and then they do a silent treatment for a while. They blow up, and then they silent treatment for a while. You know, these things are not healthy for the relationship. Some people might think a certain way about what I just said. Just just think about the habits that are formed, right? Mm -hmm. Think about the habits that are formed. If you do this on a basis that's regular, what will the partner think about bringing things up next time? Mm. You know, will they think that this is a uh, a positive experience that's going to happen if they say, hey, I have a problem with this? Or are they going to think, I think he's going to blow up and then leave the house and not come back the next day? Yeah. You know, and if they think that, well, gosh, I could imagine a lot of partners thinking, well, I'm just not going to bring it up because they're going to blow up. Mm-hmm. And then where's the, and then, you know, the erosion starts, erosion starts. When we talk about boundaries, sometimes we... You know what? Actually, let me say one quick thing about what I just said, which is is that this is really hard, but I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but I think um, it's important to talk about this now, which is is that when we get into different types of anxiety, failure anxiety, acceptance anxiety, relationship anxiety, self-compassion is huge. There's a a mental health practitioner named Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, who talks about self-compassion. And, uh, you know, you and I are guys and, you know, we're guys, we don't self-compassion. Come on. We don't feel that, you know, but it's, it's incredibly important. Mm-hmm. When we start to show self-compassion, we start to show compassion towards others. And when we talk about compassion towards others, the question is, if our partner brings up something that makes them uncomfortable, can we be compassionate enough to understand where they're coming from and to, yeah. you know, realize the priorities and the importance of upholding that, of, of, of being able to at least talk about it without blowing up. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, that's real. Have yeah. you noticed that you, you've been around a lot of artists. Have you noticed that sometimes it's easy to personalize things, easy to blow up, easy to be silent, very difficult to show compassion? Oh, the people a lot of, that are saying these things. I think a lot of artists are the 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 thing artists struggle with, in my opinion, is that we view our art as an extension of ourselves. Oh. 
So anything that's uh, any criticism that's made towards our art or our career, we automatically internalize. Sure. And sometimes it's not even necessary, you know. So um, I think we we have to be uh, a little more objective. But our inability to be objective is is what makes a lot of artists emotional when these conversations come up, you know. Instead of saying, "Hey, you know." that's just a song. I assure you, it's not about you. It was a writing exercise. Yeah. You know, um, it wasn't meant to, to, to offend you. I just pressed play on this whole CD. It was got 30 songs on it. Mm-hmm. And that one caught your ear. Um, a lot of artists will say, who the fuck are you to tell me about what to do with my right. art? Right. You know, and, and that's that defensive shell. Mm-hmm. You don't have to write. I'm the artist. I knows what I know what's best. You're just a regular person. Mm. Uh, this song is dope. You trying to tell me this shit ain't dope. Right. You don't know. Right. You know what I'm saying? Ain't about you anyway. Right. Like you can go into that, that mode uh, very easily. Uh, I think that is something I, I've definitely seen where we, we, we lack the objectivity to take a step back and just say, okay, in terms of a song, if this person knew what they knew and they're in and, and uh, without me explaining this, would they be justified in having some, some, some feelings about this? And I would say, yeah, you know, until you explain it, yeah, you know, some art does need context. Two things. First is, is that you can always, first of all, notice when you're getting anxious, notice when mm-hmm. you're getting worked up, your body will give you the signs. So real quick, your shoulders will tense up. Your breathing will tense up. It will get faster. Your heart rate rate will increase. You might start to get hot. You might start to sweat. Your hands will tighten up. Your feet will tighten up too. Fight or flight, right? Biologically, your hands are going to tighten up. Your feet are going to tighten up. You're going to notice your thoughts getting faster. Uh, Those are the signs that you're getting worked up. What you do is calm your body down. There's something called four, seven, eight breathing. You breathe in through your nose for four seconds. You hold it for seven seconds. and You breathe out for eight seconds. You do that about mm. four times. Just calm down. Calm your breathing down. Um, there are many different skills to calm down. Relaxing your muscles. Calming down. There's another thing that you can do, which is um, there's uh, Ross Green uh, and and there, you know, Ross Green developed this with other psychologists, but um, I read it in one of his books. Was talking about there's a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C to things. Plan A is is that you have to communicate something right now. Plan B is is that and he was talking about working with kids, but you could do this with adults too. Mm-hmm. Plan B means you could negotiate something. There are certain conditions to that, though. Both of you are calm. Both of you can negotiate. You're going to be in a space where you feel that you can do that. And you can always plan C, which means that you could plan C uh, away from the situation and just say to yourself, let me think about that. Say to your partner, let me think about that. I'll think about that. Let me get back to you. That's a really good point. You know what? I have to give that some thought. If you're Mm -hmm. noticing yourself getting worked up, you can always do that. So you don't just blast away. You could use that time to just calm down, take a breather. And come back to the situation. You don't have to address it right then and there. Um, plan C, there's a couple of important things to know about Plan C, though. I've noticed in my own clinical work with people, is, is that that's just not an escape pod whenever <laughs> you know, that happens. I'm just going to Plan C. Or just, you yeah, know. The other thing, it. too, is you can't indefinitely Plan C you know, for days, like weeks at yeah. a time. I'm planning C. I'm still thinking about it. You, know, like you have yeah. to you know, come back to it relatively soon. You know, it can't just be forgotten. But um, you don't have to address something then and there. You can always take it easy because the thing is, is that what's better? I mean, this is the question for the artists listening is what's better addressing it right then and there, but being very emotional, anxious about it and taking it personally and maybe creating some difficult situations or taking some space and then coming back to it when you can actually deal with it in a, in a, in a emotionally calm, uh, thoughtful kind of way. Yeah. There yeah you I agree. Is, is, yeah. I okay. Think- so let's, um, let's take a quick break. Yeah. Um, and we'll come back. We got more points to talk about. We got many more bars. And so uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll take a break and we'll be right back. 
While I got y'all here, let me remind y'all about a few things we got back in stock on waitlist.net right now. First being the King No Crown movie DVD. This is a double uh, DVD, deluxe DVD, one DVD. First DVD is the movie. Second is all the, uh, the extra features. Uh, that's back in stock. It was out of stock for a while. My movie, this is my first movie, uh, came out in 2017. Uh, free version, which is the clean versions on YouTube. This is the uh, the the unedited version, dirty version, I guess, if you will, which is available now. Wait, let's start now. Other thing, uh, ten traits of successful hip hop artists. This book came out about two to three months ago. So my latest book. This book breaks down um, the habits, you know, the traits that you see across some of the dopest artists in hip hop. This is my fourth book. And uh, so far, it's been my most successful, amazing feedback on it. This book is 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 here. Uh, if you missed out the first time, you know, it's like 14 bucks on the store plus shipping. We got uh, deals that come with bookmarks uh, with it, free stickers, autographs, all of that stuff on waitlist.net. That's that's in stock. Uh, other thing, uh, more importantly, we've restocked. We've reissued the um, two headed monster vinyl. This vinyl is a. Uh, it was red on the first pressing. This next pressing is yellow. Um, this is just now hitting. Um, so if you haven't got it, head to waitlist.net and get it. Sold out the first time in like two, three months. Uh, it's doing pretty good this time, you know, but get it if you missed it the first time. It's on yellow vinyl. Comes with a download card. Also being restocked, has been re-impressed, is the Two-Headed Monster vinyl right here. Clear vinyl, Two-Headed Monster album. Same thing. This sold out pretty fast in 2018, so we just repressed it. Uh, here, uh, but you can get that at waitlist.net and there's prices uh, Special bundle prices for all of this stuff now what's already been in stock which you probably already have if you don't just so you don't know King no crown King no crown uh, vinyl. It's a red vinyl. King no crown is a double vinyl though uh, Two pieces of double vinyl uh, But yeah, that's here um, You know, that's the record with persevere on it um, You know Dope, dope record. Great Ideas Never Dies on this record as well. But that's here. And then last thing, which some of you may have or may not, is this Vigilante Genesis EP, which is me and Aesop Rock on a production. This is available on vinyl too. But this one is uh, blue vinyl. I ain't gonna open this up just to show you blue vinyl. Trust me, it's blue. But this is, comes with all the uh, the vocal tracks on one side and the instrumentals, which are produced by Aesop Rock on the B side. So that's it. If you got this stuff already, thank you. If you don't, you know, if you want to support, go to waitlist.net. Pick up your copy of any of these things on vinyl, any of the books, the movie. We have apparel as well. And thank you for your time. See y'all soon. Peace. All right, folks, we are back. Super duty, tough work. Blueprint. Dr. Alex McNeil mm -hmm. of the Mental Health Explained podcast. Yes is here with us today and we're talking about anxiety you know i've seen people uh in hip-hop especially hip-hop say man we need to talk about mental health more we need to have a conversation we don't talk about it enough this is that conversation sure. and we're having it and and doing our part to try to make sure that people know uh what's going on have some some simple understanding of some of these things that are out there and then should you decide to take your mental health journey a little further you'll kind of know where to go and know what to expect and uh today we're talking about anxiety we've talked about financial anxiety mm -hmm. we talked about relationship anxiety mm -hmm. and now we want to talk about acceptance anxiety yes this is something that's real uh, and i think we all dealt with in the hip-hop scene because the hip-hop scene is very competitive yes you were a b-boy you understand you know how much you had to practice just to be accepted into the crew yes you, your blade had to be sharp yes and there was a point in time where all of us sucked <laughs> <laughs> we don't you know? say that enough to i you know i'm, I'm dr oh man it's 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 so cool to, to be able to talk to you as glass as well as dr mcneil because yeah. glass has been a huge part of my life but we don't say that enough to young hip hop heads. We really don't, you know, yeah. because we're all practicing these skills. And when, I mean, it's paramount for us as in the hip hop culture, for us to be fresh, to look fresh, to be on point. We don't say enough, in my opinion, 
to younger people, look, you're not going to be good when you start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's okay. And that's it's okay. okay. <laughs> uh, we, we have a move in B-Boying called the windmills. Yeah. Um, and windmills are very difficult to learn. And what you, yeah. what they don't say, what they, you know, quote unquote, other B-Boys don't say B-Girls and B-Boys. want to give a shout out to all the B-Girls out there. Um, is, is that you get bruises on your shoulders when you first learn. So the hardest part, is when mm. you first learn because you get these horrible bruises on your shoulders yeah. when you first learn mills. Yeah. And the iron, the irony coincidence you know, is, is that when you fully get it down, you don't get any more bruises. So the wow. worst part is initially. Yeah. Mm. That's a great metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> For a lot of things in life. Man. Absolutely. <laughs> life and is what we're about to window. talk about and what we're about to talk about. <laughs> Yeah. 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 And acceptance is like that. It's like we spend all this time trying to, for me, you know, I guess the equivalent would have been like b learning to battle, mm -hmm. you know, during an era where you had to battle and be yes. in a freestyle. And there would be all this anxiety about like, okay, well, what if I'm not on today? Yeah. Or what if my freestyle just isn't sharp? Or what if they're on fire? Or what if, what if he finds, you know, this angle and this, you know, you just wouldn't know. And so you get in these battles and really it was all about acceptance. You just wanted to be respected by your peers. Mm -hmm. um, but what I noticed over time with me was that the further along my art went, yes, the less stress uh, I had about being accepted in, in those competitive environments. Yes, it was. And then, you know, the art ultimately you may start off feeling like it's me against, you know, my peers or trying to, to make a name, but then you're like, yo, it's me against me now. Yes, absolutely. And so now, you know, I've been doing 20 years. My, my view on acceptance has changed, but it's changed as my view on my art has changed. Yeah. But when people are first starting out that there can be a lot of anxiety about fitting into your scene, finding your peers, yeah. being accepted, being respected you know what i mean well you i mean let's take a look at your you know i'm familiar with your career so i think it's important to point out that there is a level of so we talk about attachment theory attachment theory i am absolutely into i think it's mm -hmm. a great concept which basically means that your attachments are extremely important who you are attached to in your beginnings will affect a lot of how you develop um, and your attachments ongoing in whatever activity or whatever relationships are in your life is also going to strongly influence who you are. And taking a look at you, Print, and, and with me too, you know, who we surrounded ourselves with, I think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you in a second, you know, at least for me, who I surrounded myself with strongly impacted how I dealt with anxiety. For me, once I became a part of a crew and they really mm -hmm. supported me, you know, again, shout out to the Incredible Breaker crew. You know, the Incredible Breakers, we, we have a, a strong crew. And what happens is, is that you form these attachments that makes you know, even if things go awry, you still got people mm -hmm. that are backing you up. Even if the whole scene, you know, with B-boys, there could be a lot of B-boys that are calling you out, that are even talking smack about you afterwards, you know, but yeah. you do have that base, those rock, people that are your rocks that uh, you know are just going to hold you down no matter what. But what about mm -hmm. your career? Because you, you form yeah. weightless, right? And I'm I'd sure say the that same was, thing. Yeah. yeah, same thing, because I think, I think most of the crews I was in were formed from this feeling almost of being outsiders mm, okay you know so if, when i look at waitlist um in columbus well i'll say cincinnati where we first moved i had only been in cincinnati a year mm -hmm. and logic had just moved to cincinnati mm -hmm. when we formed waitlist so we were new to that whole scene we were both living in a new city mm -hmm. had yet to really play shows there and we're just recording and we were kind of outsiders mm -hmm. if i look at like um uh, me, Slug, Aesop, Elogic, an idea when we formed a crew called the Orphanage. Mm -hmm. We called it the Orphanage because we we called ourselves orphans, kids that uh -huh. no one wanted. Yes. <laughs> you know, okay. we're like, we're the guys that no one wants. You know, we don't fit into the Stretch and Bobito thing. We don't fit into this New York sound. We don't fit into the West Coast. We're these Midwest kids who are, you know, kind of weird, but we, we know we're dope, but we just don't seem to fit in yet. So, but we fit in with each other. Yes. So we'll just, we're orphanage. We'll be the orphan. You know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of that is, is very true. It's very true. And I think that that may be the, the, the key to it. 
like you're saying is like isolation might be one of the worst things you can do in terms of yes getting past uh, acceptance anxiety absolutely there's another thing that's really important to talk about when we talk about acceptance and failure I, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking a little bit about the failure anxiety too. When we talk mm -hmm. about this, I think two sides of the same coin, which is, is, is the idea of inoculation. So inoculating is a medical term about, you know, preparing yourself uh, for potentially a virus or for mm -hmm. something that is going to affect you. What you do is you, you, you expose yourself to small doses of something. So that way, when it gets to a larger thing mm -hmm. that you already have an immunity towards yes. it. Stress and anxiety can be very, very similar. So we've got something in psychology called exposure therapy. You know, I, I would talk to, again, I'm going to go back to the disclaimer, which is, is that, you know, talk to a medical, a mental health professional about if you want to explore any of these things that I'm talking about, but I'm just going to explain this in brief, which is, is that you become afraid of something, right? So your body builds a stress towards it. It says that this is uncomfortable or in your brain, you might even say this is bad. In order for you to just start to develop a comfort with the thing that is uncomfortable, you expose yourself a little bit at a time with things that you can are a little bit outside of your toleration so that you can be able to become comfortable when the situation arises. So a good example with hip hop, you know, you battle people in your crew first. Yes. So you battle your crewmates first and that gets you used to battling. Then you may go to a local spot. Maybe you see some people, you know, around the way you do some battles, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can go to your, you know, maybe statewide or if school jams. I was wondering about, I was going to say Jam, yeah, but school Jam is pretty big. I, yeah, you know, Columbus Expo battle or something. Cause... Yeah, there you go. There you go. And then you move yourself up slowly and slowly and slowly. So that way, if you do have a fear of this, um, it gets uh, alleviated just by exposing yourself. Now, I want to bring up the example of, I listened to a lot of different comedians and what mm -hmm. comedians say, which is really interesting is they don't try their new jokes on the big stage on Madison Square Garden. They don't. What mm -hmm. they do is they go to those small venues in who knows where, whether it's a small venue in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, or a small venue in San Francisco. I think Dave Chappelle does a lot of San Francisco, mm, yep. or, you know, or, and Dave Chappelle does stuff around the way uh, from what I understand in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Um, and they do these small venues. They try out their jokes. They kind of see what the deal is before they build up their artistry towards have those big things. Mm. Um, I think it would be totally natural. Uh, first of all, stress and anxiety is totally natural. I think it would be totally natural in general to be ex very stressed if you were trying something completely new on a huge venue. I mean, print freestyling at Madison Square Garden on yeah. your first try. Would, would you do that? <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. Right. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to perform things that you have prepared and practiced. Right. That you know work. Mm -hmm. And then you think about trying something that you don't know if it's going to hit or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I've always felt you're, you're absolutely right. Like the, 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 the bigger the audience is, the bigger the stage is, the less chances you can take. Sure. Because uh, until, you, like you're saying, you've built up that thing over time yeah. with smaller audiences and built up your confidence. Um, yeah. And, and, and I experienced the same thing touring, you know, prior to going on tour with Atmosphere in 2002, I had never played in front of more than 200 people. Mm. 100, First night on tour with them, I was in front of 2,000 people. Wow. Girls were throwing panties on the stage. Sure. People were storming the stage, doing flips. Just people were storming the stage, diving back into the crowd yeah. in the middle of the set. It was bizarre. I was like, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> what did I sign up for? I, I do have to say, in regards to your own you know, career, you know, as a, it's, yeah. it's great that I'm a fan. So I get exposed to aspects of your career. You even wrote a whole book about yes. 
strange experiences <laughs> called what a night yeah. that got you used to strange experiences. So I imagine now when you go on stage and there's something bizarre yeah. that happens, you've Nothing. already kind of been around the way and been exposed to these things. So it yeah. doesn't make you as uncomfortable and anxious. <laughs> well, nothing can surprise me now. Like, <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I've been through some wild stuff on stage where now things happen. We just keep going. Like yeah. now I'm so calm now to where like things happen on stage. Like and it can be bad things. I had a show I remember in uh Orlando several years back mm -hmm. where I was using this foot pedal to do the hook on this song, mm -hmm. automatic, and I got to the first chorus and then the pedal, the batteries died. I forgot to change the batteries. Mm -hmm. So the battery the battery's dying and I have 16 bars mm -hmm. to get this right before the next chorus or mm -hmm. this is going to sound terrible. I, I calmly switched the mics. I reach down, disconnect the pedal. I'm still rapping. Yeah. I hand the pedal to Rare Groove while he's DJing. Mm -hmm. I point to the batteries. I point to my bag. Mm -hmm. I'm still rhyming. I, I turn around to the crowd. He switches it out. He gets it back to me without like one bar to spare. I plug it back in. Boom. Right on time. But we had been through that so many random times and random things like that failing yes that i that it had built up our muscle to where we knew what it was like to fail we didn't panic the first time it happened i panicked absolutely i was like let's just do another song did you ever see i i i think we've talked about this and i think you have seen this um the last dance, right? The 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 last. You know, dance I have not seen that about Michael. Oh, Michael Jordan. I've seen parts of it. I haven't seen the whole thing yet, though. I think it's Michael Jordan documentary is really really great. One of the things that they were talking about was you might have actually seen this game, the Bulls versus the Pacers. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Bulls versus the were versing the Pacers um, in the playoffs. Reggie Miller was a part of the Pacers with Larry Bird coaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bulls were, I believe, I, I think there was 97 or 98. I'm not a basketball fan. I, I love mm -hmm. the documentary. I'm not a huge basketball fan. There was a game seven. Things were really on the line. Um, Pacers were a tough team. Reggie Miller, they interviewed people, documentary style. They interviewed people about the games and about the experiences, Reggie Miller said something really interesting. He said that he thought in terms of talent and skill, the Pacers were a better team that year. However, he said that the reason why the Bulls inched out was because they were used to getting into high pressure situations, mm -hmm. into championship situations, and they called it a championship mentality of, of just the experience. I think they called it the championship. They might have called it a different kind of mentality, but mm -hmm. the 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 concept is there, which is Reggie basically said they had the experience of being in these situations that edged out the Pacers talent and skill. And they and the yes. Bulls won. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're right. It is like a muscle. Yes. Like the more you're on stage, the more you're practicing your craft in these high pressure situations, mm -hmm. the more, the easier you can adapt when something goes wrong because yes. things will go wrong. Yes. I, I think a lot of people may trick themselves. Like you have to practice. Like there's times when I'll do stuff. We practice, say we practice here in my studio. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll be rhyming and I'll be deliberately looking at my phone. Mm hmm. Because I want to make sure I can be distracted and make it through a whole verse mm. without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I need that verse to be muscle memory mm -hmm. so that so that when I'm in front of yeah. a crowd yeah. and someone's heckling or someone's making out with a girl or someone's being obnoxious or my cable falls or my pedal falls, I can still think I, the, the, the rhyme, the performance part becomes second nature. But the other part of me can handle whatever adversity that is and keep going. So, so one thing you were just mentioning was how you're practicing it. So I want to say something mm -hmm. really quickly about that. There is a fascinating field of psychology called sports psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not extremely adept to sports psychology, but from what I understand of it, um, a limited amount of what I understand of it, what some things that sports psychologists and sports players do, they use imagery 
mm-hmm. to help a person get through their discomfort, possibly anxiety, apprehension, or just feeling of not being ready. What you do is you imagine a situation exactly how you want it to be. What is it going to smell like? What is it going to look like? What is it going to be like? What kind of stresses will you encounter? How will you react to those stresses? You can even take this a step further and write it out. Mm. I think journaling and writing is a strong, strong way to manage anxiety. Whether you're writing out in this kind of scenario, whether you're writing out what you want to happen or what you anticipate happening, and how you're going to address it, that can help. Um, you could even, uh, and this is a very, this is a separate technique, but you could even write out if you feel anxiety, why you feel anxiety. Again, articulating this, these things. But I think writing is very important. I'm going to switch back to the imagery. The imagery and the writing out what is going to happen is another way of you preparing for the actual event. You are mentally mm. preparing yourself. You are mentally rehearsing these things happening. Yeah, there's a there's a guy named Inky Johnson, motivational speaker. Okay, and he's got this saying where he says, during times of adversity, uh, he said we don't. Uh, gosh, how does he? He said we don't. He said we don't rise to the occasion; we revert to our training. Absolutely, right. Absolutely, and I, I think it's such an amazing way to look at it because how you respond in adversity is. It's not just someone pulling something out of themselves that they never thought of or was never in them. Mm. It's them actually going back to this this vision of themselves Mm -hmm. that allows them to execute or this practice that allows them to execute something that they were prepared for. Yes. You know, absolutely. There's another thing, which is, is that. When you are thinking about performing or where you're thinking about if you're going to fail or whether you're thinking about this, again, going back to the mindfulness, the cognitive behavioral things you already talked about is very important. And I want to emphasize even more than I already have of how important it is to calm your body down. Mm. Ways to calm your body. Yeah. Um, ways to relax. You could do muscle relaxation. You tense up your muscles. For Mm -hmm. a number of seconds, maybe seven to 10 seconds, you relax them for about 10, 15 seconds. And you go one muscle group at a time. You start with your feet, go all the way to your head, squeeze and relax. Just Mm -hmm. practice relaxing your muscles. You could use breathing. Kobe Bryant, we're doing some basketball references, but I love I love watching these documentaries about basketball players because they have all these techniques in this in the bag. Like they got all these wonderful mm-hmm. techniques. Kobe Bryant used to talk a lot about meditation, mm-hmm. taking some time to just calm down five or ten minutes, clear your thoughts, calm your body, cool off. Um, you can put this is a this is another one where it is is that if you're feeling really really stressed, you you put your face in some cool water. You could take mm-hmm. a shower. You could get an ice cube, put it in your hand, calm your body down, just focus on the temperature. Just ways to make your body soothe itself because anxiety essentially is going to make your body rev up. You know that the hairs that go on the back of your head, the reason why is because it goes back to when we were, we used yes. to have to fluff up our hair to look bigger because <laughs> we were we were stressed yeah. out. Yeah. So yeah, that's the thing about a again. lot of, yeah, that's the thing about a lot of fear that and anxiety that people don't they don't acknowledge now is that it's a natural response, mm-hmm. right? Like, and it's there to protect us. Absolutely. It's been there since the beginning of time to warn us, to protect us about situations that, you know, could be a danger or a threat to us. And so we, dealing with it is our job. The yeah. body is doing its job to alert us. And then it's like, okay, well, how do I navigate this feeling of anxiety? My, 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 my muscles are tense. I'm sweating. What do I do? I want to yell at this person. I'm screaming. I want to curse. And then it's like, nah, man, it's natural. Everyone feels this way. It's okay. Yeah. What do I do? How do I mitigate this? How do I manage this? Now I want to, I, I'm, I was wondering if I could steer the conversation in a particular d- direction. Cause I think there's please something do. that's really <laughs> important that we talk about though. Yes, please do. We're talking about, essentially, we're talking about performance anxiety, but we're talking also about failure and acceptance anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
we talked about a lot of different things about how to calm your body and how to calm your mind and how to you know, work through relationships and everything like that. We didn't talk a lot about our relationship with ourselves. Mm. And I want to steer the conversation a little bit. One of the big things is self-compassion, you know, showing kindness towards yourself, showing that you are a human being, um, showing mindfulness. We already explained it. Those are the three components of self-compassion that Kristen Neff talks about. But if we go a little bit deeper than that, failure and acceptance gets to why are we, and when I say we, I, I can talk, myself, talk about myself as a dancer, as an artist with that too. Mm. Why are we doing this? Mm. And that's a, that's a discussion. Yeah. That's, that's not a deep question. It's a deep question. I think it's essential. Because mm. there's going to be one, ad, oftentimes, there is a point where artists say to themselves, why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. Why am I not just a banker? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Why didn't I just accept the role of an auto mechanic and I could be on car? There's no end to cars. Yeah. No shortage of cars. <laughs> Why am I doing this? Yeah. Have yeah. you asked yourself this? Man, I ask myself that every day. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the questions I either either right before I go to bed or right when I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I got a quota. Yeah, like at least once or twice a day. I gotta ask myself, why are you doing this again? <laughs> what? How'd you get here? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's those two questions. How'd you get here and why are you doing this? Sure. And, and it's uh yeah, you have to have a strong why, you know. Sure. Um what's your mine is kind of I've always I've always had this strong sense of uh, wanting to be happy and do uh, something that brings me joy every day. Yeah. And I've had situations in the past where I had to, um, where I got a taste of just the quote unquote regular life. Okay. You know, I worked in corporate America. I mean, all throughout high school, I had jobs like I worked in McDonald's from age 16 to 18. Yeah. You know, I've worked in a cookie factory. I've done janitorial work, cleaning bathrooms. I hmm. uh, worked at Burger King. Um, I had a lot of unglamorous jobs, yeah. you know, and I have a degree in computer science and I was a, a systems analyst for a while. But what I realized in that journey was like, there's going to be some trade-offs that have to be made. You can either do that and have less stress, mm -hmm. something very predictable or you can do something that you believe is your purpose and is ultimately more rewarding and deal with certain sacrifices that come with that. And uh, everybody is kind of put here for a different reason, okay. you know? And I didn't, didn't, I don't, I feel like I'm doing, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily feel like I chose this per se. I was never pushed to this. My parents weren't like do that. They were like, do the opposite, you know? Um, but through all the circumstances that just kept falling into place, this fell into place, this record with this person fell into place, this record with this person fell into place. Next thing you know, this door is wide open okay. because you did all these things while you were doing the regular shit with everybody else. And at some point I had to run through the door it was like, I got to run through this door because I don't want to live to me the prospect of of being older and wondering what if was far more scary than a prospect of trying and failing it sounds like a huge part of this is self-concept yeah. how you view yourself yeah do you want to see yourself in one way or do you want to see yourself in another way yeah and you got to have an extreme level of self-confidence you know like to me i always draw from like my experience in the past so i say okay when you were in the eighth grade it, when you were in sixth grade you didn't make the basketball team mm -hmm. seventh grade you didn't make the basketball team eighth grade you made the basketball team but you were 13th 14th man at the mm -hmm. end of the bench mm -hmm. by ninth grade you were starting in jv yeah 
By 10th grade, you were starting varsity. By 11th grade, you were getting letters from colleges, right? I lean back on that. Yeah. I say, man, look, no one taught you how to make beats. Yeah. No one taught you how to do any of this stuff musically. You learn this on your own. Everything you learned, you know, you went, you became a computer science major. I was one of only three graduates. I have to lean on these things sometimes because I look back and, and there was moments of doubt and fear. You say, man, can I do this? Yeah. Can I be successful? I try to look back and be like, yo, you've been through something that's just as difficult, just as hard. And you have to remember those victories, you know, when you're when you're standing in the face of like doubt and, and possible failure. Perseverance is key. Yeah. Yeah. Perseverance is key. A white belt, a, a black belt. A black belt is just a white belt that never gave up. <laughs> I like that. That's great. That's great. And I'm it's sure true. you've noticed that in your own. I'm sure you've noticed that in your own career, seeing other people or in your experiences, is that oftentimes it's the people that survive that are the best. They survive. Yeah. Got to show up. Just got to show up. If you've shown up consistently, then you're going to become a leader. And you're going to become mm-hmm. better because you are still in the game. If you're still in the game, you can still win the game. Who said that? Somebody said I that. I don't know. It sounds like something. It sounds, sounds like, like something. I, I heard said. it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I can't take care of that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true, man. That, that's great. So, yeah, let's take a break. Um, so that's exception and failure. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about success. Uh, and we're going to talk about, oh, we got into performance a little bit. We got one more. We're going to talk about just like some of this pandemic stuff. Sure. You know, and uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll wrap this thing up. But, yeah, we got one more segment. I hope you all are enjoying this at home. This is uh, this is different for us, but we think that this is something that you all need. Everyone who listens to this podcast, it's great to hear a professional's perspective on these situations and scenarios. And, you know, you guys are probably learning things about me that I never talked about. But, hey, I hope that it, it, it helps you become better at what you do and avoid some of the our pitfalls. So we'll take a break and we'll be right back. Well, I got y'all here. I want to give you a quick reminder that my first three books have been repressed and are available again on waitlist.net. Book number one, Word is Blog, Volume 1. This book is a collection of some of my best blogs and writings online assembled into book form. Second book is... Adventures in Counterculture, The Making of Adventures in Counterculture. This book is about my 2011 album titled Adventures in Counterculture. This book talks about the four year period that it took me to make that album, uh, the personal and artistic changes that it took. Uh, If you're into some artistic reading, this is for you. And then the third book, which is available again, is What a Night, a book about the worst shows of my career. This book is, as it says, it's a book about the worst shows of my career, but it's actually a pretty funny book. Some stories in here are just tragic or, or bugged out, but overall, this book will have you cracking up. So if you need some light reading, something that will just make you laugh, and if you've ever wondered what happens on the road with artists, pick up this book. All three are available, 10 bucks each. However, you can get all three of them for just 25 right now. If you want them signed, please put some instructions in the special instructions box and ask me to sign them and I'll get them signed before I get them out to you. And I think they might have a checkbox for all three that allows you to get them signed. So that's it for now. Back to the show. We are back. Super duty, tough work. Dr. Alex McNeil of the mentally of the mental health explained mental health podcast. Explained, yeah. dr alex mcgill podcast that's right yeah, doc, yeah tell him hit him with that tagline yeah absolutely know. let's go <laughs> everywhere podcasts are you know and uh for all of you who are at home you know i hope you guys are taking some notes and and, and use this as a reference please reference back obviously this is not uh he said there was a disclaimer at the beginning this is not medical advice Mm-hmm. You know, this is, you know, just our opinion on some things. And he's given us some 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 technical and some some academic foundations for some of the things we hear and understand. And uh, I hope that you are taking it seriously. Uh, if you have ever thought about talking to someone, please do not hesitate. Um, it's it's perfectly acceptable. Don't beat yourself up over it. We go through things. And, and just as a car needs tune ups. Absolutely. You know, just as our our bodies need to get in shape, sometimes our mind needs tune-ups as well. 
Absolutely. and to hear some some uh, differing opinions and an objective voice uh, who can help us through situations because life is not easy. But, you know, hey, we here. We got to thug this motherfucker out. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, so uh, this next section, we want to talk about success anxiety. Mm-hmm. Now, this is something that I... I never thought of, but I think we did an episode about something like things people don't tell you about like becoming successful or something like that. And success anxiety, I've seen it go positively Mm -hmm. when artists reach a level of success, uh, their success changes their lives and their families' lives. And it's just an amazing thing to watch. I've seen the opposite where artists uh, reach a level of success and it seems to bring out the worst in them. Uh, they seem to take on some kind of destructive type of habits. I've seen some people, maybe they feel subconsciously like they don't even deserve it. Yeah. They feel like, and so they kind of subconsciously reject it and, yeah. and they're not really prepared for that success. And, and I'm, my belief is always that they never really had a conversation going in you know, and, and, and they don't necessarily have the tools to navigate it because it's, it's not something that everybody experiences. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd like to talk about just like dealing with success and, and what artists should be thinking about and, and maybe give us some framework for, for evaluating that. It's, it's a difficult topic because there's a level of exclusivity, you know, successful folks there's varying degrees of success and i think that's one of the big things to think about what does success mean you know does it mean you have a platinum diamond record does it mean that you gain recognition of your peers does it mean you've done Mm -hmm. what you need to do i'm gonna go back to something and i'm steering this a little bit but i'm gonna go back to an idea that i've been thinking about a lot uh since getting into hip-hop uh, 17 mm-hmm. years ago, <laughs> which is, is that I think there's a level of when we get into this, we have, there's some, there's some that have wounds that are trying to be healed. Mm-hmm. We create a, whenever anybody there's, there's a, there's a very old school, uh, theorist called Winnicott. Winnicott basically said that when we have wounds, especially when we're young, we develop something called a true self, false self dynamic, true Mm. self, false self. And we have to put on a mask, a false self into the world to, to try to navigate through that. The true self never dies. We sometimes know that there is a part of us that needs to come out and show how valuable we truly are, even if the world does not recognize that. We create, some, some, sometimes we create artwork that proves that value or, or attempts to prove this value, who we are. Are we heroic? Are we the heroic uh, person that we know that we are? We've got through all this stuff. We are valuable. We are worthy. Let me show you. Mm. That is a wound. Does success heal that wound? I reference a really an illuminating conversation that happened between Andre 3000 and Rick Rubin, where they talked about this. Andre basically said, to quote, no. <laughs> End quote. Does... He, he said that success, he found that it didn't heal the wound that he anticipated that it would. Mm. The value that the populace had about Andre and Outcast did not close that up. Mm. In, and as you referenced in what you were saying, it sometimes exacerbates it. it sometimes creates it even worse. Mm-hmm. Um uh, what did Fonte say? Money don't change you; it just makes more of who you really are. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure that's not originally a Fonte quote, but I first heard that Fonte <laughs> say. Yeah, yeah. 
um, not just money, but the fame, the recognition. And I'm, I'm going to turn it back to you, Print, which is, is that we're talking about identities here. A lot of times we create an identity to show how valuable we are, but then that identity that we create because we want to show our value doesn't even become who we really are. <laughs> it's true. People it's true. are clamoring for this identity that mm -hmm. we developed. Yeah. That are is not only being twisted by the public, it misrepresents you and then do you become that? So tell me a little about, about that because you're not you you're Al, you're not yeah. friend. <laughs> but I'm sure in your career people have wanted yeah. blueprint or have twisted up what blueprint is and you're like, "Wait, I'm Al." Yeah. That's who yeah, I am. Hip hip hop has definitely been an exercise in creating personas. Yeah. And creating art. Um, you know, even for me, I think the storytelling aspect of hip hop was always one of the things that appealed to me the most because through stories, you can ease more easily assume these different identities, yes, these different mindsets and say, okay, for this song, I'm this person. Mm -hmm. For this song, I'm that person. Yeah. And that always had a, a strong appeal to me, you know, to, to, to be able to kind of escape into art through different personas and tell different stories and impact people that way. And, but like you're saying, due to how people pursue hip hop, it tends to be very literal. Yes. Right. Like an author of, of regular books can write in different names. He can yes. write different characters and no one assumes that what he wrote is who he is. Hip hop. We assume that. Yes. We got the whole concept of keeping it real. Mm hmm. And that keeping it real thing can be the death of you <laughs> if you're not careful mm -hmm. because guys start to feel like they can't be themselves. Mm. They start to feel like the people don't want to hear me talk about this. I used to subconsciously tell myself, no one want to hear me sober. Yes. No one was, no, I ain't that interesting. What the hell am I gonna talk about if it's not this partying and the shit that I'm doing right now? Nobody wants to hear this other shit I talk about, but that was just bullshit. I, I was afraid to be myself a and I was afraid that people were going to judge me for myself, which would have hurt more than judging this character. Mm. It's okay for people to hurt, to judge the character. Yes. And say, Oh, the character, man, I don't like this blueprint guy. Okay, cool. Well, Al's still the guy. Yes. But what happens when you're Al and people reject Al? Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, w then the recommendation, which is, is that, Tending to your garden separately. Mm. Do you have people that love you as who you are, not your persona? Do you have people that love who, 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 who care about you, who tend to you? Do you tend to yourself? Mm. Not through your art, through yourself. Yeah. Pri so I... In preparation for this, I, I thought a little bit about this this very thing. And one of the things that I came up with was just, can you be able to tend to yourself in a private way through meditation, possibly through your own therapy? Yeah. Can you have private relationships that you go back home and you're no longer all of those things Yes. That it tends to your soul in ways that strike who you really are. And that way you're healing the wounds not through your fame, your fortune, or anything like that. You're healing mm -hmm. it through genuine connections and attachments that are that is that is the keeping it real. <laughs> that, yeah. You know what I mean? Bars. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think I've tried to do that in my career. I mean, in many in many aspects, uh, this podcast is an opportunity for Elogic and I to be ourselves, mm. you know, and, and be seen as like, these are just regular dudes who are trying to be better at their craft, be better at what they're doing and uh, are trying to share as opposed to these um, superhero like personas 
people here on record. Yes. You know, um, and, and I agree about having relationships outside of this. Sometimes it, there have been many kinds of decisions I've made to kind of keep certain things separate mm -hmm. because I need to have that. Yes. You know, like you need to have something that does not have anything to do with this art. People who known you since you was a kid. Absolutely. You know, I think I'd mentioned to you, like during the pandemic, I started going back to church and a lot of the church I went to, I go to, is like, I grew up in that church. They didn't know me since I was a baby. Mm -hmm. They know my mama, they know my, all my family. And I know people there two, three generations. They don't know nothing about Blueprint. Yes. <laughs> it's so refreshing to not have to even think about that, to not be evaluated in terms of that. No one knows. It's just, hey, hey, yeah, we got such and such going on Sunday. We got this fish fry going on Saturday. You come on out, get your plate or whatever. Hey, how your mama doing? Tell her I said, what up? Hey, you know, how your sister doing? Tell her. It's just... Absolutely. You absolutely. Know, I don't, I love it You're because of that. Absolutely. You're touching on something that's really deep, which is, is that these connections, the only thing is a lot of us, I'll, I'll lo love myself and ours too, not just as a B-boy. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> believe it or not, there's a lot of, a lot of different, um, aspects of being even a psychologist or a doctor that you take on this, you know, Dr. McNeil or, or whatever mm -hmm. like that. As a doctor, I've noticed with people, as a person I've noticed with people that when we take a look at artists, that sometimes isolation is the, well, the default mode. Absolutely. A lot of times a Artists think of themselves as different than other people. Mm. You know, they are different. So they are communicating that difference. They are communicating their specialness. They are communicating a message as something that they detect that other people don't and they want to put out. It's almost the fundamental definition of an artist. It's facts. So then the question comes, where does the fulfillment come? And that's why I really want to transition into something that I immediately thought about when you, off, when you talked about this interview, which is a really wonderful book, a little bit outdated at parts. So I'm giving that warning to people about reading it. But a Pulitzer, uh, what is it? It's a Pulitzer Prize winning book called The mm -hmm. Denial of Death by mm -hmm. Ernest Becker. And basically what it talks about is how people try to develop a sense of transcendence. We know that we're mortals. We know that we're just people. But how can we show to ourselves that we are heroic, that we're immortal, that we're special, that we're valuable, that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're wonderful, essentially. And it gets to these different ways that people try to show that, to prove it to themselves, to prove it to other people. And the ch part in the chapter that I thought about is called the creative solution. It's, mm. it's, it says that these creatives, these artists are trying to do something, but there's a paradox. And I'm going to read a little bit of a quote now, if that's okay. Please do. Please yeah. do. I remember your episode about MF Doom where you read this incredible <laughs> quote about Doom that is extremely yeah. relevant to what we're talking about, but I'm not going to yeah. get into the Doom stuff. But um, yeah. the most terrifying burden of the creature is to be isolated, which is what happens in individuation. One separates himself out of the herd. This move exposes the person to the sense of being completely crushed and annihilated because he sticks out so much. He has to carry so much in himself. By the way, this book says himself. Of course, it applies to herself as well. I think that goes without saying, but I'm going to say it. So anyways, back to the quote. These are the risks when the person begins to fashion consciously and critically his own framework of heroic self-reference. Here is precisely the definition of the artist type or the creative type generally. We have crossed a threshold into a new type of response to man's situation. No one has written about this type of human response more penetratingly than Rank. He's referring to a psychologist named Otto Rank. 
and all of his books, Art and Artists, is the most secure monument of his genius. I don't want here to get into the kind of agonizingly subtle insights in the artists that Rank has produced or to try to present his comprehensive picture, but it'll be rewards to take the opportunity to go a bit deeper. Um, I'm extending the quote a little bit. Um, the key to the creative type is that he is separated out of the common pool of shared meanings. There is something in his life experience that makes him take in the world as a problem. As a result, he has to make a personal sense out of it. This holds true for all creative people to a greater or lesser extent, but it is especially obvious with the artist. Existence becomes a problem that needs an ideal answer. But when you no longer accept the collective solution to the problem of existence, then you must fashion your own. The work of art is, then, the ideal answer of the creative type to the problem of existence as he takes it in. Not only the existence of the external world, but especially his own. Who he is as a painfully separate person with nothing shared to lean on, he has to answer the burden of his extreme individuation, his so painful isolation. He wants to know how to earn immortality as a result of his own unique gifts. His creative work is at, at the same time the expression of his heroism and the justification of it. In his private religion, as Rank puts it, its uniqueness gives him personal immortality. It is his own beyond, and not that of others. No sooner have we said this than we can see the immense problem that it poses. How can one justify his own heroism? He would have to be as God. Now we see, we see even further how guilt is inevitable for man. Even as a creator, he is a creature overwhelmed by the creative process itself. If you stick out of nature so much that you yourself have to create your own heroic justification, it is too much. This is how we understand something that seems illogical, that the more you develop as a distinctive, free, and critical human being, the more guilt you have. Your very work accuses you. It makes you feel inferior. What right do you have to play God? Especially if your work is great, absolutely new, and different. You wonder where you get the authority for introducing new meanings into the world, the strength to bear it. It all boils down to this. The work of art is the artist's attempt to justify his heroism objectively in the concrete creation, it is the testimonial to his absolute uniqueness and heroic transcendence. But the artist is still a creature, and he can feel it more intensely than anyone else. In other words, he knows that the work is he, I'm extending a little bit. It is ephir eph ephemeral, which means very, very short-lived, is potentially meaningless unless justified from outside himself and outside itself. And the quote goes a little bit further, and I want to read a little bit more about what he says further on, which is, is that the whole, the whole thing boils down to this paradox. If you are going to be a hero, then you must give a gift. If you are the average man, your gift, you give your heroic gift to the society in which you live, and you give the gift that society specifies in advance. If you are an artist, you fashion a peculiarly personal gift, the justification of your own heroic identity, which means that it is always aimed at least partly over the heads of your fellow men. After all, they can't grant the immortality of your personal soul. He goes on. That the only way, they basically said that there are phil phil philosophers like Rank and Kierkegaard who say that the only way out of human conflict is full reunification to, gives one, to give one's life as a gift to the highest powers. Absolution has to come from absolute beyond. And I reflected on this and I, I, I wrote, who are you giving the gift to? What are you trying to prove? And if you are trying to prove something... Who is fit to justify it? People? Yourself? Your finances? Ultimately, those are transient, as this argument follows. If you devote it to a higher power, however, that has flexibility and immortality to become the justification of your work. So I am not saying, per se, that 
there is a need to do anything. But what I'm saying is, is that this book argues that the artist is really trying to prove something. But the problem is, if you're trying to prove it to people, well, that that can sway with the wind. If you're trying to prove it to your finances, that sways with the wind itself. If you're trying to prove it to yourself, the question comes, who are you to prove it? You're the one that's creating it. Don't you feel like you have a little bit of a bias there? And, you know, you're creating it partially because you realize how limited you are. So then who can you prove it to? And one solution that this book posits is, is that you as an artist are doing this for a higher sense. Now, what that higher sense is up to you. For you, Al, you just said that it was because of your own sense of your own identity. Would you feel as, as a person good about yourself if you did not follow this path? Because you felt like this path almost chose you. Yeah. You know, these are important questions to ask because the thing is, is that as an artist, I've noticed that a lot of artists get anxious because they lean their justification for their art and their meaning and their existence on other things. Maybe it's themselves. Maybe it's other people. Maybe it's their finances. Maybe it's their rep. Maybe it's something else. But then yeah. they get smack in the face of realizing that those things are so limited. Yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah, the question. So so that was a long quote. That was a long passage. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I actually think out of all those reasons to do it, doing it for yourself is the best reason to Tell do it. Tell me about it. Yeah, why is that? And, and, and I think that because, like, if I imagine myself, mm -hmm. I always have to ask myself this with music. If you had none of the followers, yeah. if you had no career, you never made a dime off of this, if you were, uh, I don't know, a janitor and you just learned how to make beats or some shit like that and you still like records, and, but you never put out a record, would you still love doing it? Yes. And the answer would be, yeah, I would still, there's no feeling like making a dope beat. Right. Writing a dope rhyme. Because it's like, that's, I was doing it for years before i ever had any recognition mm -hmm. and really at that point the only reason to do it was because the challenge the technical challenge of it and i loved it there was something i immediately saw the first time i made a beat i never felt nothing like that before right and then ultimately for me people liking it making money off of it mm -hmm. the the career came but that was more like the icing on the cake mm. To me, um, and I and I have no doubt that when I'm 70, as long as I have the means, 75, I'm gonna still be making beats. So I'm gonna still dig for records. I don't care. No one has to hear it from me. So it goes into a type of therapy that we haven't discussed so far, but I think is important to know, called acceptance and commitment therapy. Mm -hmm. What acceptance and commitment therapy basically says is that okay. Life is stressful. Life is tough. Can you accept this? And then are you in tune with your own internal values that you are able to be aware of them and to be able to commit to them through action? Right. So what this book said was basically a, a the book advocated a, a sense of transcendence over the material. What you're saying mm -hmm. is that for what worked for you was a value in your own sense of meaning of your own self. The commonality is, is that it is your value system. I, I, I want to say a, a exercise a little bit. Listeners can draw a bullseye uh, like a target mm -hmm. and they could have different rings in the target. In the center of the target, imagine is you living a life of you doing all your values. Your actions are completely aligned with your values. And then what you do is you break up the target into different slices, financial, relationship, artistry, mm -hmm. you know, community. You have all those different aspects of your values. You outline what your values are. And then each day what you do is you put a point 
on how you've done in acting according to those targets, uh, sorry, according to those values. So maybe one day you didn't act very well uh, according to your values in terms of your finances. Mm -hmm. Then you would be farther away on the target. Maybe one day you really are moving towards what you want to be as an artist in whatever definition you want, in whatever way you want, whatever values you have, then you're closest to the target. That could be a really good exercise for listeners who are saying to themselves, why am I doing this? I'm feeling anxious. I'm straying away from things. I'm not on target. Um, that could be very good. Yeah. So overall, what we're talking about is really purpose. Yes. We're talking about purpose. We're talking about, and it's so funny that acceptance and purpose go mesh together if you look at it deeply enough. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so for me, it sounds like, because yeah, I can see the complete opposite of people because so for me, I could say without any of this extra stuff, mm -hmm. I love the craft. I would do it right mm. there are people who but there are people artists who are on the opposite who if they don't make the money yeah if they don't get the acceptance of their peers yeah. if they don't have the careers they don't see any purpose in exploring it that's a, and and it goes back to the book because that's a tough thing because let's say you do earn the money let's say you get a smash hit you got you know yeah. um a smash hit you know I was about to make up a name of a song. I'm not, I'm not uh, but let's say you get one of those and you get a ice, lot ice of baby. money. Right, right, right. You get a lot of money, yeah. right? And because your value is the money, mm -hmm. the problem is, is, is that, and is that it is, it's gone with the wind sometimes. It, it could just, it can just go. And then where's your sense of self worth? Yes. So that's the danger. So it's just things to be mindful of, figuring out for yourself what works, what really works for you. Yeah, 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 because the other things do come and go. And I've always felt like I'm the only thing I really control yes. out of all of this. I, I can't control whether people like it. Mm -hmm. I can't control whether it sells and I make money off of it. Mm -hmm. I can put forward my best foot, but it's really up for the people to decide. So I always early on was like, yo, this is for you. Ooh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Man, I've been wanting to ask you this for <laughs> just on a personal thing, but we're saying this on a podcast, you know. Yeah. But um, what was it like for you with uh, the Counterculture album, Adventures in Counterculture? Yeah, that was a trip. That was a weird experience, man. That it was, was a. It was a divert, but it was yeah to me as a yeah. fan. When you put that album out, it was it was clear that it was like Print wants to be him. Yes. But I imagine in you being you, there might have been some friction. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It was and, I learned the most from that record in my career because I think that record I had to confront all of these things. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing it? Um what 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 is people's expectation of you mm -hmm. artistically? Mm -hmm. Does that match with who you are and where you think this shit should go? Mm -hmm. You know, what by the time the 1988 record came out, I had already been starting on adventures. Mm -hmm. I was already moving down a path to creating music like that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I mean, and even prior to that, I think, cause I was starting to play more in 04, I think 05, I was on tour and started getting into like playing more, but I was already there. Mm -hmm. But by the time that record came out, people expected something completely different from me. Right. And so there were definitely people who were unhappy, who were just shocked. Like, why'd you do this? Why'd you take it there? Now the record is looked back on like, yo, this is great. This is a classic, you know, but when it initially came out, there was definitely some pushback on it because the expectation did not match. You know, the album didn't match what certain people's expectation and vision was of me. Yes. I saw myself as an artist the whole time. Okay. I saw myself as an artist at the same artist I was on adventures. I saw myself as that artist who just felt like making a record like 1988. 88. I was going to say that one. Yeah. You know, I'm an artist, but I want to pay homage. So I'm going to do that for this record. Mm -hmm. I'm an artist, but I want to make a bugged out instrumental record. So I want to make this chamber music record or the sign mm -hmm. language music record, you know, to pay tribute to, you know, like the DJ shadows and the Prince Paul's and the, and a, and a DJ spookies and the guys who influenced me. Right. 
uh, DJ Crush and all them. But so to me, it was nothing different, but I didn't know how the public worked at that point mm -hmm. and that I was far along in my career that I was established. Mm -hmm. Those records, those soul position records, that 88 record, that established a brand. I didn't know anything about branding mm -hmm. and that whether I liked it or not, I had kind of put myself in a certain lane and that once I deviated outside of that, it could cause people some, 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 some frustration with me, mm -hmm. you know, but I just had to let that go. I, I had to make the decision. And like you're saying, imagine with the, the example you laid out, you have the circle, right? Mm -hmm. The closer you get to that, the center of that circle, the happier you are. Absolutely. I was in the center of that circle. <laughs> you felt like got, with that album, you were in the center? I, absolutely. I got to do whatever the fuck I wanted. Mm -hmm. I got to be as weird or as conventional. Every single piece of thing that was inside of me musically, I got to do from 80 sound and shit to slow shit to like bouncy evil shit to party shit to you know what i mean like to just raw rap 48 64 bar shit I, just telling stories and singing all of that is what i do artistically personally every story on there was from the fucking heart it was real and so um there was not a point that the making of that record was one of the most pure artistic journeys i've ever went on because I did not give a shit about money. I didn't give a shit about time. Mm. I didn't give a shit about none of that stuff. Like all the shit I had built up in that career going into that, I could have just dropped a record that was similar to 88 and had massive success mm. a year after that. Mm. I was like, that's not the kind of artist I want to be. I want to set myself up to be an artist and have 10, 20 more years after this in a different direction or whatever direction I choose. And that can only happen if I get into this mode and really artistically develop into who I know I am and I can be and put it into a record. So, so that's what I got to do. For the purposes of this topic, I have to ask then, mm -hmm. when you were in the center of that circle, how was your anxiety? I don't think I had a lot. Not musically. Mm -hmm. I had none musically. I had, I mean, relationships, nah. My, my life was partying and having mad fun. I mean, <laughs> but, but the important thing but, was that when you but, were in that circle, yeah, mighty was less. Yes. You felt like you were aligned with your values. Felt exactly. Like on top of things. Yes. Yeah. But I had to sacrifice yeah. certain things though. So when I was making that record, I absolutely had to sacrifice like certain financial things mm -hmm. because I literally didn't tour for like four years. Hmm. for an artist that's very hard to do most of us can't survive not touring one year yeah i had to change things in my life and do certain things was like okay you have to learn how to live on that hmm. every month that's it you have to learn how to you're gonna get a, a show every now and again but you have to turn down tours because you know that if you want to go out there and do that you're not going to be able to do this you'll never get this thing done You'll start BSing, you know, yourself. So I turned certain things down, um, certain relationships. I, that wasn't a priority. Yeah. It was like, nah, I was, I was like, I was saying comfort. I literally slept on this couch over here behind me for like <laughs> two years. That's <laughs> unbelievable. I, I slept on that thing. I, I, I got so used to sleeping on it. When I started sleeping in bed again, it was weird. Really? I'd wake up. I'd come right to this desk. I'd, I'd compose right here on my keyboard, try to write two to three melodies every day. Some suck, some didn't, but it taught me just about objectivity, how to, how to truly, truly uh, be an artist, not just a hip hop artist, an artist who makes hip hop. And uh, that record was kind of like college for me, yeah. you know, in the same way you go through college and you broke, but you love it. Right. So you're like, yo, this, I'm around my peers. You know, I was going to more shows than ever. I was doing sh uh, shows with bands and collabing with bands and musicians. Musically, artistically, that was the most the, the most expansive time of my career. Yeah. You know, uh, my social circle was just incredible because all the shit I was into and on, you know, I was going to, uh, you know, you remember redo house music night at Bento Go Go. They used to have. Oh, <laughs> I was there every Tuesday. <laughs> 
man. <laughs> that used to be cracking. Columbus back then, man. Yeah, man. Oh. So, yeah, I was I was right there, you know. But I will say this, which which kind of hits on something you're saying. As we get older, our values do change, right? Absolutely. And so I think yeah. now my values have changed. And as I mentioned, you know, there were certain financial things I was putting off, wasn't handling. And um, I think that now my values have changed a little bit. Yeah. I try not to look at it so extreme, you know. And, and that's okay. It's okay if your values change. And it's okay if yeah. you go from, from you know, uh, more of a, a self uh, values to more of a the book talks about the more transcendent values about, you yeah. know, whether it's religion or whether it's, you know, doing it for something else, yeah. you know, a higher thing, you know, but the, the, wherever your values are, if you're aligned with it, it's, it's critical. There's two other critical things that you mentioned that I really want to touch base mm -hmm. on. First is we've seen in the, we've seen examples of a lot in psychology. I've seen examples of a lot in psychology, at least that, Discipline oftentimes helps with anxiety. If you're disciplined and you are able to set concrete goals, not values. Goals and values are very different. Mm -hmm. Values are overall your, your, your thoughts about something and the overall your, your feelings about that. Goals are concrete. I want to save X amount here or yes. I want to create this then. But if you set those and then you create discipline, you were talking about sleeping on the couch, which is unbelievable and but that's what you had to do and then you created an album and then you felt fulfillment from it mm -hmm. and then you felt less anxiety yeah you knew what you had to do and it might have been a struggle but it moderated your 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 anxiety it was able to alleviate your anxiety when you were able to follow through with the plan the other thing too that's really helpful is um the exact well I, we haven't really chopped up uh, uh, y y the origins of this podcast, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, to me, this podcast represents you taking a mentorship role. Yes. And I am a huge advocate for people. In fact, I base my whole career on it for people to get help if they need to, whether it's a mentor, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a person in the community, it's to get help. We, as, as, as we've talked about extensively in this interview, there is a sense of isolation a lot with artists, mm -hmm. um, existentially, you know, practically, in every single way. But you're not isolated. There are resources, especially with the internet. Yes. So I advocate for listeners to alleviate their anxiety also by getting help. You're not mm -hmm. going to be good at everything. You are a human being. You are flawed in certain things. And we are diverse of a, of a people enough so that there are people out there that are good at the things you're not. Thank you. And, and you can get that help. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. I wanted to give a plug for those two things because you touched upon those things earlier and I wanted to highlight them. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think that was I think that might be it, man. What about do you want to talk about the do? pandemic stuff? Or oh, the pandemic. That's the last one. Yes. Yes. Because we got to end with that. Okay, because sure. that has created such a unique uh, situation for artists uh, who already are isolated, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. And now we have a situation where your range of, of movement is now more limited. Um, you're not getting out as much. You're staying inside justifiably, you know, to, to not just to create art now, mm -hmm. uh, just because there's not as much to do. And I think it has created certain things from, you know, weight gain to you know relationship problems to uh, these questions about our, our our purpose and what are we doing now if we can't share our art like we could before or we can't experience art like i could what we could before and um yeah I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on just like what what artists should be thinking about in the midst of this and and, and uh, there are signs that it, we're starting to come you know into a different phase of it but I do think a lot of artists may have a harder time adjusting because they were more isolated going into it than anyone else. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Mm, it's a good question. It's a good question. It's a tough question. <laughs> Through the pandemic, I think what everybody has been doing has been looking in, mm. reassessing the topics of this conversation not only facing the anxiety of practicality, which we started with, 
but sort of the values systems that we've ended up during this mm-hmm. course of this conversation. It, I think if you are able to assess where you're at, recognize it, accept that, be able to understand your anxiety, and then, well, I think this pandemic, I, just just to, as you like to say, keep it funky. <laughs> <laughs> We're keeping it funky. Yeah. Is, is that adaptation has been a huge theme of this pandemic. Uh, Erica Badu, did, did she created her, I mean, the versus battles alone yes. have shown us the adaptation. Um, the logic, did he make the streaming before the pandemic or was that a pandemic? No. Because of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic. Uh, being, being able to utilize the internet or utilize your community or somehow figure out another way to do it. Maybe there's a project you've always wanted to do, but you wanted the world to pause for a little bit before you did it. Well, now is the opportunity. I mean, I know where people are getting vaccinated and stuff and things are opening up again, but there's still time to kind of do that project that you've always wanted to do. I agree. But I think there's a sub question in the thing that you were talking about, which is isolation. Mm-hmm. How do you manage isolation during the pandemic? And that's a tough, that's a tough question to answer as a, as a professional. We have something that is, I, I think our profession has really um, evolved. Our prof- uh, the uh, our profession, meaning the psychologists, have really evolved in creating something called telehealth. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to pl- do a plug for it a little bit because I think it's important. Therapy traditionally was in person. Now we can do it over the computer. You can find mental health help with a person who is licensed. Uh, for psychologists, they have to be licensed in, in the state you're in. So they have to be physically present and licensed in the state that you're physically and present in. That is one large resource that people can have. Other resources include online communities or online forums, somehow getting involved in that, somehow expanding your business past that. And in terms of other things, well... I wish I had more to say than what I'm about to say, but what I'm about to say is very important, which is, is that we haven't talked about depression. Depression oftentimes leads to more depression. Mm. You know, depression is a, uh, it's almost like quicksand. And one of the big things about it is that people become isolated and they stay isolated. They all of a sudden don't want to do the things that they've wanted to do before. They all of a sudden don't want to be around people anymore. They want to lock themselves in. Treat that like you're treating your food getting moldy or your, 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 your physical body getting sick. You want to, you want to cut that at the the root. You want Mm -hmm. to notice that quickly and cut it at the root. You get in touch with your family you get in touch with your friends. You you take a walk in the park with them. You know, you wear your mask, but you take a walk in the park with them. You go to the activities. There are activities opening up now. Mm-hmm. You go to those things that you used to love. You 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 hey, if you want to date, go online and date. Put on yeah. a mask, go and look at, at you know, look, go to the park. You know, something like that. But notice that quickly because I think that that is ravishing people across the country. And uh, it's important to take note. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Very wise. Um, I want to add on to something like that that's helped me during this time is uh, visualization. Okay. Um, for the last year, what has helped me is trying to come up with an idea, an image of who I want to be at the end of this mm-hmm. that was different than who I was at the start. Mm-hmm. Um, so like this week's episode on the show we talked about which will be last week's um just like health mm. and i told myself you know i'd gained some weight so i want to i want to i want to be in shape i mm. want to be toned and right yeah. 
Yeah. And so I have this image that I formed in my head, like, okay, you've got between now and the end of this. Mm -hmm. So now I have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And I all, and by making this vision of myself at the end, I'm telling, I'm teaching myself that, Hey, remind myself, this is only temporary. Absolutely. This is not forever. This too shall pass. Yeah. Which is important. I think we can, we can get into these things when people, all this talk about the new reality, the new reality, new reality. Your reality is what you make of it, mm. you know, and you want to be somebody. I told myself, Hey, I want to be in shape. Mm -hmm. I want to have new, two new books mm -hmm. and, uh, I want to have some money stacked up. <laughs> That's who I want to be. And it, it's, it's given me that became the thing that created the motivation or inspiration to the discipline that I have every day mm -hmm. in the midst of, like you're saying, not have these things. I need to start doing some of the things you're talking about. My social life has taken a bit of a hit, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, I still have great relationships with my friends, but I do need to get out a lot more. Mm -hmm. And that's something I want to start doing soon. Uh, really like right now, especially now the weather's nice and like, it's like, man, there's no reason. Just go out, get out. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, the visualization has helped me and I have to add on that part that you just talked about. It, it speaks to something that in psychology we call locus of control. So that's not like a, a locus, like in the, <laughs> like an insect. Insect. <laughs> We're talking about a concept which basically says, do you see your control over life as coming from within you or outside of you? So if there's a person that's very, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, I'm going to do it myself. I'm just going to go about and those are internal locus of control people. Mm -hmm. external are the people that rely on institutions and structure and the system to, mm -hmm. to give them their, their sense of, you know, life. Those are external uh, locus of control. Being in the middle is, and somewhere in the range of the middle is typically the healthiest. I've noticed that the people during this pandemic who have more of an external locus of control have had a very tough time because everything shuts down. The yes. institutions that they were relying on is shutting down. All of the things that they depended on for their nourishments, uh, spiritual, psychological, even physical, have, mm -hmm. have not worked the way that they needed it to, and they become mentally ill. Mm. And the difficulty is sometimes it, there, there's not the resources, the internal resources to pick themselves up and, and do the visualization that you're talking about, make the plan that you're talking about, have the goals that you're saying, have that internal drive. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, so for listeners, one of the things to think about is just kind of to get in touch with those aspects of yourself that you want to do and strategize in a very optimistic way of achieving those. Mm. I think a lot of these, the, the folks who have more of an external locus of control, they start to think about this and they become pessimistic. Yes. I can't do it. No, nah, man, I, I could never do that. I've never done it before. I can't mm -hmm. do that. It's like, well, try little at a time, you know, get, get reinforced by the small successes and the small steps that you do. Yeah. That's great advice. Great advice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's it this week. That's it. That's it. Let's let's talk about where people can find you at, man. Where can they find you, sir? Called Mental Health Explained, a Dr. Alex McNeil podcast. And yes. it is on Spotify, it is on iTunes, it is on Google Play, it is on SoundCloud. My website is alexmcneil.com. That's A L E X M A C N E I L dot com. And he's got an email list up there too. You have an email list We're working yet? on the email working list. Working on that. Too. Okay. But well, listen. We, you can always contact me. Yes. Always contact me. There's a contact me thing. We've got the email set up. So, yeah. Yes. Please contact him. His show um, is going to ultimately be, and it is ultimately a, a resource mm -hmm. for people who are trying to learn more about mental health, um, which is something that, you know, we he is trying to kind of demystify. Absolutely. And I hope that this podcast has done a, a, a good job at that. I feel like we went really deep on this one. Mm -hmm. And um, what you hear here is what he does every week on the show. 
you know, he does this with other professionals within his industry mm -hmm. and they talk about the process. He lists resources within his area and other areas for you to take advantage of. And it's something that I think is needed. As you know, you know, this is a hip hop head, a B boy, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? He'll tear mm -hmm. you up on that dance floor and <laughs> challenge him. <laughs> his window Battle is me. very mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Don't 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 touch the dock on the dance floor. Let me show you some things. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's it's been more than an honor, Al. I mean, I've yeah. we've been you know we've known each other for so long from Columbus to Boston, and yeah, man. this this podcast it, it's really it's it's a pleasure, it's an honor, it's it's a privilege to be on this podcast and be able to help people. And I hope that listeners take this and have things to think about, have things to reflect on. And most importantly, there are going to be people that listen to this that are turned off by mental health. They're going to mm -hmm. be people that are turned off from getting help. Yes. yes. And hopefully while well, listening to this gives you a little bit of a sense that this is people helping people and these the field of mental health is here to help. And that's exactly its purpose. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I hope you guys got something out of this. This is a, you know, super dope interview, a lot of resources. And, and this is probably something you can listen to multiple times Absolutely. because we went into so many different types of anxiety. Um, if you're at home, please let us know what you think in the comments, especially if you're on YouTube, you know, uh, SoundCloud, where you can type in a thing, Instagram, you know, follow us there, uh, listen to this podcast and, and check him out. And uh, hopefully, maybe we'll have him back here in the future, kind of like Oprah and Dr. Phil. Anytime. You know I mean? <laughs> Anytime. And uh, we want to thank y'all for listening, and uh, we'll catch y'all next week. Take care. Peace. Peace. Thank you for listening to Super Duty Tough Work. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Follow the podcast on SoundCloud. Peace. Shoot, I got styles already that's more complex that nobody know about. I mean, super duty tough work, huh? <laughs>